are going to start recording. Um, so I wanted to start by kind of, again, a quick overview. We're going to be talking the next 30 minutes since we're starting a little bit late, 25 or so. Um, and I'm giving a very, a very small sample of many, many examples that we could dig into or put a fork in, pardon my bad joke, if you will, um, from Papa's collection about food and feasting. Um, and so I want to start with a really serious image, of course, um, if Susanna will advance the slide. Um, thinking okay. of, oh, one second. Okay, um, that was a joke. So I wanted to start, of course, with a meme um, <laughs> where all important things happen. Um, okay, perfect. So, so this is an image, um, not from Papa's collection, obviously, from the internet. Um, but when we were coming up with this idea, something that I, I thought of, um, this image that I've shown me. And I, I feel like in this moment where we feel like so much has changed, um, it reminds me with a little bit of art, perspective, art historical perspective how little really has shifted. Um, so, you know, maybe instead of fruit, we have sourdough. Um, and instead of wine, we still have wine. Um, but this kind of going, going back to food always being the basis of a shared reality. Um, so as a cornerstone of our very existence, food has always played a significant part in our social and cultural lives. Um, it's since it's interwoven so much with the aspects of our lives, um, it has to do, it, we can use it as a way to talk about larger themes like politics, gender, religion, or class. Um, and again, I'm going to jump into just a couple examples of Papa's collection, and then Meg and Susanna are going to jump in and talk about how they relate to things that they've, they study as well. So if we can advance the slide here. So for many of us, I think when you think about images of feasting or consumption from our history, what might come to mind is an image like this. Um, so this is Still Life with Fruit by Severin Rosen from 1855. Um, and I think this is an image that really directly answers how artists are depicting the stuff around feasting or around physical food in our history. So it's very like canonical image. And so the images that predate this 1855 painting really started in the 15th century onwards. And so this is when you have artists taking increasing inspiration from the culture of antiqu antiquity and the natural world. And they began um, using a variety of still life objects in both devotional and secular images. So food here is a primary source of information. Um, and it's also a place where artists are showing off not just a realistic perspective, but their own skills of observation. So a little bit about the artist, um, Rosen, he was trained as a China painter um, in his native Germany and immigrated to the United States. And he actually made this piece in Williamsport, Pennsylvania around the middle of the century. And what I, I didn't know in my research was that Williamsport at this time boasted more millionaires per capita than any other locale at this time. And so it was a very enterprising um, place for a young artist. He actually left New York City to go to Williamsport, which is crazy to think about doing that um, now, um, but I think this really indicates his uh, desired patrons. So he's painting a, a portrait for the rich um, of things that they would want to represent themselves. So everything from the warm tones and the meticulously rendered fruits spilling from these wicker baskets um, is coming from the grand still life tradition of 17th century Dutch painting, which is a, a genre that will never fall out of style with collectors. Um, but also including um, some symbolic ideas of the transience of life, but really more about um, the rich bounty of the upper class. So. so one of the things that I think really links this imagery with sort of that meme that Abby posted before is basically the extent to which these paintings are really about display. I mean, they are for an audience, they are constructed by very wealthy patrons who are able to gather this fruit together, which was not easy to do in, you know, Holland in the 17th century, um, and pay someone to sort of capture it so exquisitely. Um, this is actually a big difference with the archaeological record because we're really constrained or freed by whatever people leave behind. So no one leaves stuff behind for an archaeologist to find. Um, we're basically digging through people's trash, uh, which means that um, we don't necessarily get to see these like 
big, beautiful, sumptuous displays, which is what people wanted, uh, you know, the, whoever commissioned this painter wanted these fruits to be displayed in this way. Um, but we can sort of see what was going on in the kitchen a little bit. Um, maybe the things that we don't want to be on display, but have to do a little bit more with what people might actually be doing in their day-to-day -day life if they're not eating uh, giant bunches of grapes. Um, so I think, how, how, do we, how do we get from there to here, Meg? Um, yeah, so I think one of the points I wanted to make with respect to this that, that Susanna just brought up is that one really key difference in the way that archeologists are able to do this sort of thinking about food and about what people eat versus the way say art historians can do this are really due to the biases that are built into our data sets. And so um, of course painters are not like systematically heading to their pantry and making sure that they depict absolutely every single food that is in there, whether it is beautiful and delicious or gross and rotten. Um, Archaeologists, on the other hand, sort of see everything that was there, everything that was thrown away, whether it was the part that was on display to the public or not. So, of course, meals themselves were still forms of display in the past when people feasted. They were doing so in a way that made food ostentatious and big and visible. But the fact is that when they threw everything away, they threw it all away, no matter what. And so that gives us a really different data set to work on. Um, so what I put up on the slide here is just to give those of you that may not be familiar with archaeological data a little bit of information about um, where every archaeologist's mind goes to when someone mentions food. So, um, you know, as Abby said, when you talk about food in an art historical context, I think even my mind like immediately goes to like a still life of some fruit or a fish. Um, and for an archaeologist, when you talk about food, the place everyone's mind immediately goes is food remains themselves. So things like the animal bones in the top left of this slide or seeds, like the things in the top, uh, the sort of bottom left. Um, and then ceramics, the materials that we cook, store, display, consume our food out of. Um, so these are sort of the things that archeologists minds immediately go to. And the examples that I have up right now are examples from the Penn Museum's collections. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to sort of mention about this is that our methods, of course, of studying it are also really different. Um, this is what it looks like to be either a zooarchaeologist or a paleoethnobotanist. Those are subspecialties of archaeologists who focus on food remains. Um, so the picture on the left there is a zooarchaeologist comparing an ancient fishbone on the sort of uh, right in their right hand um, to a modern one in their left hand, trying to figure out exactly what type of fish is being represented by this bone. Um, I picked this picture because I think of fish as something that constantly shows up in still lifes in art history. So um, I picked a fish one. And then the picture on the right is of someone um, using a microscope to separate and then identify the tiny remains of plants that are left behind, um, particularly if they're burned or otherwise preserved by kind of unusual mechanisms in the archaeological record. So this is a really painstaking form of analysis, but allows us to get a, a fairly full picture of the foods that people were eating. Um, that said, I think it's important to point out how much we miss because of this as well. Like a plant really has to be burned in order to make it into the archaeological record, particularly in the American South. And so we miss a lot. It's not to say that our data is complete, um, but in some ways it can definitely be thought of as, as sort of different from the art historical data set where people are really thinking about the audience that will be viewing their painting when they're painting it. Um, and people, as Susanna said, in the past weren't thinking about what an archaeologist might be thinking when they dug up all of this material. And we really can sort of build up these different pieces into a sort of more complete picture on a even just basic level. When I um, worked at Meg's site in Mississippi, there's uh, three mounds. Uh, one of those mounds, uh, two of those mounds had a lot of feasting remains. One of them had all of the mammals and one of them had all the fish. Uh, so it was either different communities or different, you know, th these things were available in both, like obviously in that area, like both things were at the same site but where they were consumed were very, very clearly spatially differentiated. Um, and I think it just gets to, again, back to the art historical point of food is not always about sustenance, it's, it's about emotion and, and sort of how we build meaning out of food. Um, 
So I know at least uh, it, very recently, I, I cooked a six pound brisket for two people in my house um, because that's what I eat for Passover. Uh, and the fact that there were only two of us could eat it did not stop me at all from the fact that it was a totally non-practical uh, food choice. Um, so it's worth remembering, even when we get really sort of scientific about this, all these little bits of bone and seed, that we really are building up to people's um, very emotional choices. Oh, Abby, I think you're on mute. Yep, I figured that would happen. Um, I, I was saying that I think that's a great transition talking about emotions. Um, so, and jumping, so here we're jumping even further, a great distance in time. So this is a more contemporary image um, from the collection. It's one of my personal favorites. So this is A Farewell Feast by Willie Birch in 1988. Um, and so I, I picked this piece as one that I wanted to showcase because it, I think it, the artist is teasing out how, um, what foods roll in as in community and how artists use food and gathering as a way to depict different groups and identities. Um, and so backing up a step, if you're not familiar, William, uh, Willie Birch, he's a New Orleans artist. And he's really famous for painting everyday situations in great detail, which create these um, compelling narratives. And in, in Farewell Feast, we have this fashionable urban interior. And if you look in the top left-hand corner or right-hand corner, um, there's colorful masks. There's also framed pictures. Um, and so this is, uh, he's setting up kind of a, a banquet scene, but a very approachable one that we can see. Um, and so this is one where we, we might guess based on the title who might be saying farewell. If it's the man um, sitting on the far table with the white hair, he's the departing guest. Um, but what we can definitely tell about the group is their diversity. So the artist is really telling the story using the dress, pose, features, and expressions of the people in the painting, even those with their backs to us. Um, and so Birch's paintings in general always really address his life in his urban setting. Um, but here we have this hopeful image. He's taken us inside to share friendships and the sort of conversations happening in a community. Um, and the other point I want to make is that this painting um, seems to be a coming together of affiliated disparate communities through food and feasting. So I've been thinking a lot about the idea of how we make an us through food. Um, and just an aside too is that, you know, this is the kind of image that makes me the most nostalgic for the moment that we're in. So this is the idea of feasting that I miss, the way food brings us together. Um, and I know it's something that we haven't lost and that people are finding creative ways around the problem of social distancing. And so just to plant the seed for later, I'd love to kind of hear from our audience how they're feasting and sharing in new ways at this time, um, inspired by this, this piece for me. Yeah, so this is actually one of the places where artists play such a critical role in archeology, span um, because basically we have to make the jump from imagining how all of those seeds and bones uh, add up to our understanding of feasting or sort of communal eating. So Meg, do you, do you want to talk a little bit more about how, how we make those jumps? Yeah, so you probably noticed when Susanna introduced me that I'm an archaeologist, but I'm actually situated academically in a department of anthropology. And that means that as an anthropologist, I'm kind of inherently interested in much bigger questions than like identifying seeds and bones and making a species list of foods that people ate in the past. Um, I'm really more interested in those questions that Abby just brought up that relate to how we make groups out of through food, how we use food to create ritual and group identities. Um, and so to do this, you know, we have to make a pretty big leap between these tiny remains of plants and animals and these big broad pictures like um, the painting that was just up on the screen before. And so I wanted to talk sort of a little bit about two of the ways that we do that. Um, this jump to sort of re revealing, I guess, like moments from real life is a really complicated one in archaeology. We're a data-driven science. We like to stick to our data, but at the same time, we want to ask these bigger questions. And so we're really interested in, in sort of humanizing the past and reminding everyone, including ourselves, that people lived there and people felt things and experienced things at the sites that we study, um, not just eight things that we can list. Um, 
So one of the ways that we do this, of course, is through a detailed study of the landscapes in which we find all those artifacts. And so on the screen right now, you can see pictures from the excavation site where I worked with Susanna and continue to work. Um, in the top left, there is a picture of the biggest mound at the site. Um, it's about 35 feet tall. I know that's a little hard to tell from the picture with no scale. Um, and so to some degree, we think it's about- It's tall. <laughs> it's tall, three, a three and a half foot <laughs> building, basically. It's, Susanna had to climb up it every day. If you fall off, it would hurt. Yeah. It is tiring to climb up. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, and so, you know, just even by recognizing how much effort it would have taken to construct something like this tells you that the types of eating events that were taking place there were probably not just your average everyday eating event. You know, people were constructing these mounds in a time prior to the um, use of metal tools without the help of pack animals. So they were digging the dirt by hand, one basket load at a time, and then carrying it over to a mound, this is kind of what you can see being depicted in the artist rendition, the bottom of the slide, carrying it over to the mound, dumping it, going back for more, doing this process over and over again. So this was truly sort of a labor of love and a labor of devotion for the people who did it. Um, the picture on the right side of the slide is me standing in one of our excavation units. Um, this unit has uh, really beautiful soil colors that you can see, and you can see some really nice basket loads in there. I don't know if you can trace some of them. Yeah, there you go. That's um, yeah. like a perfect identification of how archaeologists <laughs> know how these mounds were constructed. Um, but still, you know, we have to go somehow from that picture on the right to that picture on the left, and doing so takes a lot of sort of archaeological imagination, combining data with an artistic eye for what this scene might have looked like in the past. And so we actually rely really heavily on artists um, to do this work, at least of taking what's in our heads as archaeologists and sort of making it more publicly accessible. Um, so this is one way that there's a lot of, of overlap between art and archaeology. Um, another way is uh, the fact that we often have to rely on historic records a great deal in interpreting things. So, of course, we want to use our imaginations and we want to think through a data-driven explanation. Um, but we also have other lines of evidence and other data that we can rely on. And so the picture that is up on this slide is an early engraving made in the sort of mid-1500s. Um, and this was made in Florida, um, or based on a description of an event that took place in Florida. And it's basically a, a ceremony taking place between European explorers and native people in which they're sort of celebrating the coming together of these two very disparate groups of people by consuming this highly caffeinated beverage called black drink. Um, as archaeologists, it's really interesting to take an image like this and try and understand what archaeological data is being depicted. So how can we then look and say, okay, well, we can see that they're using certain types of vessels. We know that they're um, consuming certain types of plants as a tea. Um, we can even use sort of the um, ceramic residues, things that are absorbed into the ceramic vessels to test for the presence of caffeine, something that would definitely be present in really high quantities in black drink. Um, but then at the same time, when we look at an image like this, we have to be aware of the biases that it includes. You know, this was etched by um, a Frenchman, someone who was visiting the United States for what was not yet the United States for the first time, um, making contact with cultures that were very different from his own and being interpreted through a complete lack of speaking the native language. And so, of course, all of the information that he's depicting is being filtered through his own mindset of coming from, you know, a Western civilization with a king, etc. Um, so when I look at this image as an archaeologist, I see all sorts of potential, but I see all sorts of biases that we need to be really careful of when we try and translate artistic works like this sort of back into archaeological data. And that bias sort of exists, I think, in all imagery and all art. I mean, it's, it's, we're all humans and we can only sort of create from the position that we're in. Um, so I know that's something that uh, Meg and Abby and I were talking about is the way that bias um, finds its way into these different conversations. And I think Abby had a um, particular piece that made her think about this. Uh, yeah. You're muted again, Abby. Yeah, and then just, um... An interesting idea, I think, of food and bias in this piece, um, definitely. So 
This is one, the last piece that I'm going to show from Papa's collection is um, Judy Chicago's test plate from the dinner party, which you can see on the side um, there. And I think part of why I wanted to talk about this isn't just the bias, but sort of the unique way that the artist took on uh, the physical surroundings from feasting to convey identity. But I also think it's a really important place to kind of tease out bias, um, both intentional and unintentional. Um, some background on this piece uh, is the dinner party is Chicago's most celebrated work. And some have even gone as far as to call it the most popular feminist artwork. I don't know if that's still true today, but um, it really functions as a symbolic history of women in civilization. So if you see on the right hand side, this is how it's been permanently installed at the Brooklyn Museum, uh, this long table. So here you have 39 elaborate place settings arranged along a triangular table for 39 mythical his and historical famous women. So among those with place settings are Sacagawea, Sojourner Truth, the Empress Theodora, Virginia Woolf, Susan B. Anthony, and Susan B. Anthony and Georgia Keith, among many others. Um, and the central um, image on each of the plates is the butterflies, which you can see here, which is an ancient symbol of liberation and resurrection. But of course, it's also vaginal imagery, um, purposefully. And so um, I think of this piece as sort of a pan-historical fantastic party. And not only are there plates, as you can see, but there's table runners, utensils, chalices, and porcelain, along with the plates. Um, a little bit about kind of what went into making this too, which I think would be interesting kind of thinking of it as an archeological, from the archeological standpoint. Um, it took five years to realize this massive piece. It's 48 feet on each side. Um, and it really celebrates the historical achievements of women in Western culture. Um, along with Chicago, she didn't make this by herself. She had 400 volunteers um, and many of whom specialized in forms of so what's called domestic labor. So labor that's often not acknowledged by the contemporary art world. So here you have China painting and needlework included in this painting or in this piece that um, kind of makes them a part of the canon of art history as well. Um, so this is a monument to women's history and accomplishments. And I love the way the artist uses the dinner party as sort of a metaphorical seat at the table when you think of the canon of art history. So we don't see the diners and know there's only one plate that's actually figurative, um, but their legacies inspire each of the ceramic plates. So they're, they're sort of a reinsertion to art history. Um, but I also have to mention, and I think we kind of teased this at the beginning, is even this piece has faced criticism. Um, so not just by you know, people not as a fan of feminism, but from people kind of looking back now. So as I mentioned, this is a piece permanently installed in the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Museum. Um, and in a recent review of the museum's Radical Women exhibition, critic Esther Allen wrote, um, it's now quite hard to keep from noticing that none of the 39 great women granted a place at Chicago's elaborate table is from Spain, Portugal, or any of those empire formal co former colonies in Americas. So like Frida Kahlo is not among these people. Um, and so here you have a piece that even so heavily about representation can fall short. Yeah, so that sort of gets into the complexity, I think a little bit, just a little bit around um, food and identity and who makes it into the canon. Um, so this whole piece is all about women being wrapped up in food and food sort of symbolism. Um, but not making it into the canon. And even when it does make it into the canon, it is, you know, contentious. It's, there's a legitimate critique that, you know, there are people being left out. Uh, and then there's also the problem of why this one artist has to represent all women. Um, and, you know, Native American, not, not to draw a perhaps stretched parallel, but Native American communities are often left out of uh, the canon in Western canon American history, um, in part because they, in, at least in North America, didn't have writing systems that were comparable to what we have. So what we recognize as history or legitimate data um, is just wasn't there. We basically didn't know where to look. Um, there's also the obvious issue of political power and the fact that, you know, Native American communities were very forcibly removed from, from their land. Uh, we here at uh, PAFA, and anyone in Philadelphia is on Lenny Lenape land um, right now. Um, but at the same time, food gives you a way to get back into those spaces that 
sort of communities get excluded from. So when we are able to find historical Native American communities, and so for, it, it, it is often through food and feasting. Um, the site where Meg works, Smith Creek, um, probably was inhabited by um, ancestors of the Natchez Indians um, who are no longer really exist as a tribe. They, they sort of didn't um, make it as a community through the process of colonialism. Um, so there's individual members that, you know, seem to have made their way into other communities. Um, but that history and those humans um, were sort of lost. Uh, but we can find aspects of it through through food and feasting um but that doesn't so that, that that emphasis on lost is one thing and then there's the other hand but there's still native american communities who are present um they're not all gone uh so i think meg meg works with some of those communities i think and talk about that a little bit more yeah, so one of the things, like one of my immediate reactions to this, I think, was so interesting because as an archaeologist, um, we often are missing the people from something, like the physical people, and we're putting together stories based on the plates that are left behind. And so the connection to this piece, I think, is, is really interesting. Um, and yet the, the fact that we're missing those people, the, that those people aren't physically at the table for all of these discussions, is based on the violence of the colonial encounter and the process of forced removal um, during which you know, the, the burgeoning American population moved Native people forcibly off their land out West. And so I think one of the things that I personally and we at the Penn Museum are really committed to doing is providing methods to bring those voices back into these conversations. And this is, of course, a difficult and a fraught process. And I think the criticism that has been levied against the dinner party is a great example of sort of good intentions and yet something's still going wrong and still not being able to do a good job. And I'm, I'm really sympathetic to that. Um, but um, I wanted to show you at least one example of a piece from the Penn Museum's collections that maybe allows us to span the archaeological and the art historical a bit. Um, so in addition to individuals from the past who can sort of be brought to light through archaeological investigations, archaeologists are more and more often turning to contemporary Native communities as collaborators in telling these stories, recognizing different sources of data that they might hold that we don't have access to as archaeologists. And a really great example of this is the Penn Museum's Native American Voices Gallery, where archaeological objects are displayed alongside contemporary Native art um, and these two sort of different lines of evidence come together to tell the story of both past and current Native communities in the United States. Um, so this is one of many Native, uh, contemporary Native pieces that's in that gallery. It's called Nestling Worlds. It's by um, an artist from the Santa Clara Pueblo, and it represents a woman who's sort of sitting, as you can see, and hugging a set of clay bowls. Um, and so I really liked this because it's still riffing on this idea of the bowl and something that you might serve food out of as being just somehow deeply meaningful to us as humans. Um, this artist in particular is known for making clay sculptures of human figures that depict sort of human compassion um, that are very expressive and gestural and are intended specifically to draw viewers into what we as humans might share as part of the sort of broad human experience. And I think one of the points we want to make with today's discussion is that food is definitely one of those things. Um, so she says, the artist says that she believes human emotion is a universal language and has the potential to connect people everywhere and she embeds messages of respect, protection, appreciation, and love for the earth through things like her sculpture, including including this piece. Um, so I thought this was kind of a really good way um, to, to talk a little bit about, you know, the relationship between archaeologists and contemporary Native communities and the, the things that bond humans together despite their differences. Um, so I think I'll stop there because we're approaching our like 615 cutoff. Um, so I'll just say that I know archaeology is new probably to a lot of people in the audience. And so as we go through the discussion portion of this, um, I'm happy to take specific questions. If you type things in the chat and we don't get to them, I will um, I'll be happy to send some emails and fill people in if there's detailed questions about archaeology. But I think uh, Susanna wanted to start us off maybe with a more general discussion question. Yeah. Um... So I think 
one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation is because food is such a great connector. I mean, you can talk about it across archaeology and art history and across uh, millennia in this case. Um, so I sort of shared a story about making a, a very impractical brisket uh, recently um, because that's what I felt like needed to happen to make my holiday real. Um, so I was just wondering if anyone has thoughts about um, either ways they've used food to cope with this situation or ways in which sort of the absence of sort of an eating community has really been felt um, in this situation. Uh, yeah, I, I, I want to know what any of this means to you. So people are thinking of responses, um, just as a reminder, so you can sort of raise your hand and you should pop up on our screen through the participants part where we'll discuss that way. But I wanted to throw in one thing, which is that um, I'm going to turn the camera on this. My friend Anna is sitting <laughs> with me right now. Um, and I have to say that when I think about sort of the um, the memories that I will come away from this like period of quarantine with, uh, the vast majority of them involve the two of us being experimental in the kitchen. And I think that with respect to this question, and I don't know exactly, you know, where this will go, but one of the things that surprised me the most is that we're not necessarily making the things that remind us of home. So like the things that you were talking about, Susanna, it's more that we're like, let's try something wholly new, something we've never done before. And I kind of wonder if that's related to this feeling that we're in a situation we've never been in before, um, but we're definitely being much more experimental than um, I would ever be either alone or not in quarantine. Um, I've also found myself being a little more experimental. I'm a baker at heart, so I'm a little more measured, but I think a lot of us have found working through those, this new set of challenges. Um, I wanted to ask a question from the chat, um, and I think this is to you, Meg, um, but Monica would love to know if there are any particular feasting traditions from communities you've studied that you think are the most novel, interesting, creative, um, or lovely. I feel like the people who are on this call who know me would think, Monica, that you asked me this question because there was a specific thing I wanted to talk about. Um, and I know that's not true. So <laughs> oh, I just wanted to know personally, like what cool thing you've discovered some community has done that I can know about or replicate or steal or honor. Yeah, well, I'll leave it up to you whether you want to replicate this one or not, but certainly honor. Um, one of the things that was the most unexpected for me when I started doing particularly my dissertation research, was, which was on a site about 35 miles north of where I work currently, um, is that when we started analyzing the animal bones, so doing the zooarchaeological research, we came across massive amounts of bear bone, um, much more than had been uncovered at any other site in the eastern United States at that point. Um, and I kind of, this is something that happens to archaeological researchers a lot, but I kind of got thrown in the deep end with it quickly. You know, I, I now had to learn everything I could learn about bears and about how native people view bears. And that research has led to a couple of recently published articles, basically in which I argue that humans, humans broadly, but Native American groups in the United States specifically, view bears as inherently very different from other animals, um, and particularly as more closely related to humans. And they have a lot of reasons for doing this. Some of them are very basic things like they walk on two feet in a way that most other animals can't do. They build their own dwellings in the form of dens. They eat roughly our same diets. Um, and I guess when you skin a bear, something I've never done, it looks remarkably like a human, kind of terrifyingly like a human. Um, so this is something native groups would have been very familiar with. And the way that the bare bone is treated at this site and the context in which we find it tell us that it was not being consumed like normal animals. It was being treated sometimes like a food and sometimes more like kin or someone like a, like a, a member of the community. And so um, I've really come to, to view bears and to think about bear feasts in Native North America as a way of sort of, sort of drawing together the human and the non-human kin that Native people see in the world. And I think that's a really beautiful reminder that like the line between animal and human, between human and spirit, between past and present is much more blurry for non-Western communities um, and is a good reminder sometimes um, for those of us that, you know, are, are raised to think an animal is in a zoo and a human is at our 
dinner table. Um, and bears really blurred that line for Native people. So yeah, that was a, a great, a great excuse to tell that story. <laughs> Oh, and that's a great answer. Although to your opening point, I will be honoring and respecting it, but not replicating. The bear. <laughs> I'm, not going, I'm not going bear hunting currently. <laughs> I think that's a good decision. <laughs> um, it looks like uh, Carrie is curious if archaeologists ever see contemporary food trends uh, through the patterns of your training. Uh, I can answer personally, yes. Um, it's, I, I, especially when you end up in a deep dive on something, like I've stared like weirdly long periods of time at like the um, uh, knife with peanut butter on it and like wonder how I, that might be analyzed um, a thousand years from now. Uh, so I'd love to hear from Meg. I'd also love to hear from my friend Hannah, who is also a zooarchaeologist uh, in the audience. <laughs> about how we see um, sort of contemporary, how, how contemporary food trends sort of intersect with what you see in the record. Cool, well I can jump in first and I'll, I'll hand it over to Hannah. Um, so from a slightly different perspective than what you're talking about, I mean, yes, absolutely. Archaeologists are material people and every time I break something and throw it away, I kind of <laughs> think a lot more than your average person about what that might tell somebody about me in the future. Um, but I think one other thing that's worth mentioning here is that there's some really interesting projects on the archaeology of the contemporary right now. Um, and in particular, there's a, an interesting project that's been running for a couple decades now um, called the, the Garbage Project. It's out of the University of Arizona at Tucson. And they do a lot of interesting research basically comparing what people say they eat and throw away to what people actually eat and throw away. And it turns out that we are very dishonest people when it comes consumption patterns um, and that like you know we tend to throw away a lot more vegetables and eat a lot more candy um, not surprising I think to most of us um, but I think that this kind of harkens back to that very first point we made at the beginning which is that archaeology gives you a, a bit of a, um, a window into reality that sometimes our even our own understandings of our, our food consumption can't give and so I do often think about that when I throw something out um, and I think like, why did I let that thing go bad? And I didn't let any of this other, you know, I read for me personally, I rarely let bread go bad, um, but vegetables will go bad sometimes in my fridge. Um, and that says a lot about me. And so I think, you know, that's one way where archeologists and this project's being run by an archeologist is, is really directly trying to reflect on contemporary food trends as well. Hannah, do you want to add anything? I think one thing that's kind of fun about this that I always think about is um, so the scale that you would guess of the number of people eating when I clean up the trash at the end of the day. So like what Thanksgiving dinner looks like versus a potluck versus uh, me cooking for myself um, or just a friend. And then the other thing I think about a lot, so I'm an archaeologist, so the image of someone comparing a fish bone and an archaeologically recovered bone is very familiar. Um, and so there are so many aspects of what we eat that we don't really think about as being very culturally specific. So like what a cut of meat looks like and how you can see differences between what, um, you know, like the way that I think to make something versus say my husband who grew up in a very different sort of tradition. We have sort of different ideas about what these things are. And so you can actually like kind of tell who makes what if you were to look at our trash, that sort of thing. It's kind of a fun thing to think about. Um, it makes you very introspective. It's a good way to pass some time. Also yeah. makes me realize uh, one of the things I've I've realized being at PAFA, so there's um, there there's a big wide you know art historical vocabulary a vocabulary of images um, that is very new to me that I'm learning right now. Um, so I'm used to thinking about things archaeologically, but I'm not necessarily used to thinking about how you know that portrait where the person is holding a peach. Um, you know, is signifying something very specific. Um, so I, I'm just curious, any, any of the more artistically oriented people out there, either practicing artists or art historians, um, did anything sort of like flash in your mind that relates to sort of the symbolism of food or maybe how you use food that might be tied to your training? I guess I might ask if we could let people think on that for a second. Or no, we have Matt, because I want to make sure. Let's hear from Matt and then Nicole. I know you have a comment too. So Matt, go for it. Yeah, well, to Susanna's point, um, 
at the same time that I was studying fine arts, I was studying anthropology. Um, and so the methods in which I look at a still life are informed by those two different like um, um, trainings. So for example, when Abby, when you were having the imagery up and then started, Susanna, when you pointed out the culture at the time and how difficult it was to acquire that fruit, that's what I'm thinking about initially when I look at it. Like how does that painting, um, how does the imagery, uh, be, how is it produced basically? Like how are the methods of that production and then what's the meaning behind it? Uh, and so I initially start with, okay, I see the objects that I'm looking at, I have to understand the culture at the time, uh, and then my art history mind comes forward and I'm like, what are they trying to say and what is the thought behind it? Um, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm 50-50 in the group of looking at it from an art historical perspective and then also from an anthropological one. Do you just want to go to museums with me all the time? Because I feel like I need someone <laughs> to translate my anthro brain for art museums. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea because I'm just going to want to pick your brain on everything. <laughs> Might work out well. <laughs> I agree. Let's definitely schedule museum visits when we physically. Yeah. Um, can we, uh, Nicole, I've, I've seen your hand up for a while. Can we hear from you? There we go. You're unmuted. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I was just going to go back to your question about, you know, kind of what we're doing for food during this quarantine. And I know for us, it's a little bit more unique because we have a multicultural family and with two religions. So right now is um, we had just, my family and I have just moved back from living over in the Middle East for eight years. So we have the culture shock, but we're also at home. So we're actually able to have more time to celebrate the food that we miss from the Middle East, which is quite different to Western food. Um, my father is a background, you know, Italian food and my mother's typical, uh, you know, British and Irish food. And so to bring that Middle East piece in with my spouse, um, they're being introduced to a lot of foods that they wouldn't normally be experiencing um, in a definitely more authentic way than you might get if we were going out to a restaurant. Um, but because it's Ramadan right now and um, he's Muslim, we're also talking, we're dealing with fasting and the specific holiday foods that are eaten during that Ramadan time. So it's just actually really giving us a lot more time to do, to spend on these meals that do take a lot more preparation because it is such an old culture. It's a lot of components to cooking. Um, my husband hadn't eaten anything out of a box or a can until he was about 16 because everything is just, everything's by hand, everything's from the farm, everything's fresh. So it's been interesting. Elena, I wanna just, hey, I just wanted to share that um, I'm from Norway originally, and a couple of years ago, we made a cob oven, which is uh, probably, I'm guessing, maybe you guys know cob uh, houses was made like 10,000 years ago. I'm not sure, but we have been in the process of making this for a while and now having time to actually fire, fire it up and cooking, and it's been a really nice experience cooking that way. And once we get it fired and the heat going and the perfect time, we just put everything in and been cooking for hours. So that's been, um, it's been a good experience. Different way of cooking for sure. Cause it's not something that you, you pull together after work or yeah, it's been good. My archeologist brain really wants to know how different your trash looks with that style of cooking. <laughs> <laughs> when the style of cooking you were doing before. <laughs> so but that's really fascinating. Yeah, and then and I, you can drop in a chat. I don't know anything about um, that style of dwelling or oven. That's so cool. Cup oven, it's made um, basically out of dirt or mud. Uh, and if you have 30% uh, of uh, clay, it, uh, and it's different layers. So if you Google on YouTube, um, how to make a cob oven. It's a gazillion videos of it. Mm -hmm. And um, you make it into stages, uh, stages and it's really fun. It's a fun thing to do. It will take you a couple of weeks with the drying and, and everything, but it's fun. We got some time. 
<laughs> Thanks, Lena. Um, Ariel? Hi, I just, I really found this whole topic fascinating because I actually work in the restaurant industry. Um, oh, yeah. I'm a bartender and a server, and um, th there's two very interesting dynamics about this that I'm noticing. Um, one is how people are reacting to not being able to access food and also how servers and chefs and bartenders are reacting to not being able to provide that to people, especially chefs who really appreciate spring for the bounty that it offers and often are foraging and creating food in their kitchens that they want to share with people, um, particularly ramps right now are like the big thing. Um, but I, I really find it interesting to watch how they're trying to like through social media create this space where they can continue to offer this to people and continue to provide meals and that warmth that you get from almost watching them in their own kitchens presenting this work for people and then offering to sell it you know but for delivery or pickup it's just a really interesting fascinating time to watch this change in how we approach dining out that's also kind of a communal ritual that we engage in all together um so that's just kind of my and that seems so related to to other forms of art and what people are doing now, like the number of musicians that are performing live shows via Instagram and Facebook. And, you know, it's like everyone that has that artistic brain is trying to figure out the best way that they can express that without a live audience or dine in people. And I, th I think that's that's actually been really inspiring, too. I know Anna and I've been listening to a lot of live music, probably more than we would have if we'd been able to go out, um, just because it's a reminder of how hard those people are working to sort of maintain the artistic community we all live in right now. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm with you, Ariel, that, um, you know, it really helps relax me, like watching cooks, like there's certain ones on Instagram that I follow and um, even just like Bon Appetit videos of like all of them in their home kitchens and like they don't have all their fancy gizmos, but they're still like making it work and like wanting to share how um, how to do a recipe with maybe half the ingredients that they used to have um, or that you might have. And so um, that was part of what I think inspired me to want to talk about food because that's the thing that's, I think, giving me joy and peace in this time um, is cooking, but then also just like seeing how other people are cooking and how chefs are still um, still kind of feeding their audience even if they can't physically do it, um, but in a different way. So, yes, <laughs> that's my partner's favorite. Um, but yeah, um, I want to make sure to give a second to Susanna and Meg if you want to say, I think we're, we're, we've come to our kind of end tonight, but I personally wanted to say thank you to all of you for being here and talking about, um, about food and, and sharing in this community um, with all of us here. Yeah, it, this was an honor. It was exciting to get to talk to people outside my discipline. Um, so I, next time you do one of these, I recommend that you all um, get the Dogfish Head like Ancient Ales series. Mm -hmm. And when you do, just know that they're based on recipes fr that were extracted from Penn Museum pots. So talking about relationships between archaeology and contemporary food, it's always important to mention that. And if I had been more on top of it, that's what I would have been drinking tonight. But um, I resorted to just plain wine. These these are these are times of 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 scarcity we, we make do actually one of my favorite um foods to make in the field and hannah knows this i don't know if i ever did this in mississippi meg but our latkes potato latkes because you can almost always find potatoes and onions and like egg it's like a very universal type of food you never um, did that in mississippi <laughs> what i said no you never did that in mississippi no fair <laughs> there are we did, we did a lot more big group cooking in Mississippi. It's hard to make for a group. In Azerbaijan, it was like day off style. Like this is what we're doing for the day. Um, but yeah, I, I think that um, the, the making do can kind of make new traditions sometimes and also having the space to um, make things that you wouldn't usually make. Um, all I'm thinking as I hear everyone talk about what they've been making in, in lockdown is I really want a post lockdown uh, potluck uh, where everyone has to bring something that they learned how to make because they were home all of the time. I don't know quite how to make this a reality, but I think it's, it's a good aspiration. Um, and I've really enjoyed this as a chance to bring together uh, things that I think are really fun and interesting, which is art and archaeology. And I'm so glad that everyone uh, was able to join in. Yeah. Thank you. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe, and we hope to see you again at another 
the forest. So take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.